Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, as we turn to your word, bring it alive for these people. Let them be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. Thank you, Father, for what you're about to do. It's great. In Jesus' name, amen. The, uh, the sermon this morning is not for you. It's for the person next to you. Amen. I want to deal with an issue that comes up, I think, in Christian life all around the world. And that is the times that we fail God. We, we know that there are times in our lives when we reach great heights, great triumphs. And at the end of the day, we walked away and said, you know, that I did exactly what the Lord wanted. I, I boy, I, I tell you, I was on fire today. It's wonderful when you get an opportunity to witness and testify. But what about the days where you feel like maybe I failed the Lord today. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Now the rabbinical teaching of the time was that you must forget, forgive three times. If somebody comes up and says, I'm sorry, you must forgive them three times. That was the teaching of the day. But Peter wanting to show his magnificence of spirit, says up to seven times. He's expecting the Lord to come back, but no, 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 three times is just fine. Up to seven times. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 490, by the way, in case you're doing the math. It's a Semitic way, an ancient way of saying an innumerable number of times. There's no cap on it. Imagine the shock on poor Peter's face as he is thinking that his seven times was pretty magnanimous. By the way, some of you might have 77 times in your text. It could either be translated 77 or 70 times 7. Either way, the message is the same. The message here is you forgive and you keep on forgiving. If he's sorry, if he repents, you forgive and you keep on forgiving. Now we have to ask this question. Would God ask you to do something he himself would not do? Would God ask you to be more forgiving than he himself? I don't think so. I believe, in fact, that God being God would never ask his creations to do more than he would do. And so you come to this conclusion. As God has said, you must forgive an innumerable number of times. He too forgives when we fail. 
He too forgives when we don't always knock the ball out of the park. There are times when I'm preaching and I know I'm knocking the ball out of the park and there's other times when I'm preaching and thinking to myself, dear Lord, when will this be over? Much like some of you. And on those days when I, 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 I wish it was over, I, I, I think to myself the next day, I don't know why I'm in the ministry. But God is gracious. God is merciful. God is kind. And He's forgiving. He's forgiving. It's not all that He is, but He is forgiving. Take your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 for a moment. Colossians 3, 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are the very characteristics of God. Now watch. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Now watch. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. There it is. He does not ask of you anything that he himself is not willing to do and currently already doing. Now is this an excuse for failure? No. Does this mean you just go home and indulge in whatever? Because you know God will forgive you? No, it, it does not mean that. What it means is on the times when you're not up to it. When the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. On the times when you just don't fulfill the commands God's given you for that day. He's gracious. He's merciful. And he's forgiving. Verse 14, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you're called to peace and be thankful. Over all these virtues put on love. Why? Because God is love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. When we look at the very ministry of Christ, we see something very interesting. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke 24, verse 40, 45 for a moment. Luke 24, 45. Luke 24, 45 says this. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them what was written, the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, beginning in Jerusalem. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. Now we know that there is repentance and forgiveness for the unsaved. That is without a doubt. But I have to believe that it's not just for the unsaved alone, but that God forgives and is merciful to the saved. It would be of no value to save you, only to have you fall away five minutes later. And so his saving grace is forever. It does not mean that you're going to always live up to the top standard. I wish it did. And I know many of you wish that you could be a much better, stronger, more powerful 
Christian than you are. And I think that we need to strive and work towards being better. But understand this, God knows how you're made. And he is merciful and he is gracious and he is forgiving. In Matthew 26, 26, it says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body. And then they took the cup and gave thanks and offered it, uh, and he offered it to them saying, drink it or drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. There will be times when you will go over the top, there will be times when you will be, if you will, the exemplary believer. And there will be times where maybe you don't make that very high grade. So what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You appeal to God's grace and his mercy. Now I said at the beginning, this sermon is not for you, it's for the person beside you. Sort of too bad if you're alone in the car. But here's the bottom line. Whether we like it or not, in fact, take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter three for a moment, verse 21. Three twenty-one, And here's what it says. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, a righteousness. I could play with the word in English, but it's not a right etymology. But it basically means of being right with God. Now, of being right with God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This being right with God, or righteousness from God, comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. This time we're getting a little more personal. It's not the guy beside you, it's you. All have fallen short. Well, you just don't know me, Pastor. I, I, I am a super Christian. I am remarkable. As I like to tell people, I'm humble and proud of it. Why my humility knows no ends. Sometimes I just sit in the mirror and love on myself because I'm so humble and not a sinner. I'm saved. Well, you need to get over yourself. I'll tell you that. You need to get over yourself. And realize that all have sinned and fall short of the glory. In the Greek here, it's a word that talks about the shooting of an arrow. But instead of that arrow hitting the target, the arrow falls short of the target. The target is the glory. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Then it says, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We fell short. And from time to time, we still fall short. Sometimes you find your temper getting away on you. Sometimes you find your mouth 
uttering things that should not be said, whispering secrets, transferring gossip, saying little things in Christian ways. And the truth is, it's below you and it's below him. But the truth is also that we have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. God presented him as an atonement, a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one that justifies those that have faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? Nobody's got anything to boast about. It's all been done by him and is continually done by him. The times you think you failed him, his grace has been extended to you. Because it's never been about your performance. It's always been about him, his work, his grace, his mercy, how much he loves you. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, we read this. The ministry that Jesus received is as superior to uh, theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. It's founded on better promises. The old covenant said, you do this, you do that, you do the next thing, or you'll die. You do these things, or I will cut you off. You perform, or else. If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and I led them. Amen. Out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor uh, or, his, uh, or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins. No more. Amen. I will remember their sins no more. You know, you remember your sins, don't you? David made a tremendous comment about this in the Psalms. He said, my sin is ever before me. I remember... And many of you have seen the same thing, the old cartoon of the donkey walking up the street, pulling a cart. And the way that they keep the donkey moving is by holding a carrot out on a stick in front of the donkey. So the man sitting in the carriage behind has a long pole with a carrot on the end of it. And he holds it in front of the donkey's nose and the donkey is ever trying to reach the carrot. He never can reach it and that's why he walks forward. David said, my sin is always before me. And I'll tell you what, the times you fail God tend to stick with you. But know this, he said, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. <laughs> Amen. You might remember it, but he is not. 
when you get to heaven, he is not going to be standing there to judge you with a list of the sins. There will be things that you'll be judged on. What did you do with what I gave you? There's no doubt about it. But he will not be walking down a list of all the things you've done wrong in life. Because he says, I will forgive the sins and I will remember their wickedness no, no longer, no more. In Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, for just as though the through, pardon me, just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also the, the obedience of one man many are made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. That's an interesting statement. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. Could you imagine if there were no road rules? You're all in vehicles this morning. Could you imagine driving home if suddenly there were no laws in Canada on the roads? You could drive at any speed, stop at a stop sign or not stop at a stop sign. It's up to you. How, how do you feel today? Well, you could never be ticketed because there'd be no laws. But because now there are laws in place, people are kept safe and there are punishments for breaking the law. But I wonder how many of you remember every ticket you've ever got. Because I'll tell you what, the times I remember are the times I was pulled over but let off. Just a couple of years ago, I was in the States. I was going down to uh, Seattle. I remember those good days going down to Seattle. They're coming again, don't worry. And coming back from Seattle, I got pulled over for speeding. And the cop was a very young man. He came up to the car, swaggered, his big old gun hanging off him. They don't play around down there. They're ready to draw if they think they need to. And so we were polite and he asked for my identification. I handed it over to him and he disappeared into his car, sat there for the longest time and finally came back and I thought, oh boy, here it comes. This is gonna cost me. He said, I see it's your birthday today. I said, yes, sir, it, it, it is. He said, happy birthday. Hand me back my, my license and said, slow down, and he drove off. That forgiveness had so much more impact on me than the ticket would have had. I would have paid the ticket and forgot about it. But the forgiveness I will never forget. You have been forgiven so much. You are expected to be forgiving an innumerable number of times. Therefore, I have to accept and believe that God is also gracious, that he is also merciful, that he is also forgiving. And on the times when you break the law, there is forgiveness and mercy. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so grace might reign through life, through righteousness, to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace might increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live to it any longer? His point is this. There are times when you're going to fail. 
There are times when you're just not going to be the super Christian you wanted to be. Should you revel in it? Should you indulge in it? Should you get down under it? Absolutely not. You need to repent, get back up on your feet, dust yourself off, and carry on serving the Lord. Stop wallowing in your failures. It will do you no good. Let it go. Turn it over to the Lord. And be grateful that He hasn't charged you, but that He has forgotten your sin and remembers it no more. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. This is the message we heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there's no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we lie. and We do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin and unrighteousness. If we claim to be without sin, and by the way, many people claim to be without sin. If, by the way, you're ever witnessing to somebody who says, but I'm a good person, I'm not a sinner, ask them what sin is. And you'll discover their definition of sin is not a biblical definition. Sin is anything that transgresses the known will and character of God. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what are we saying? We say as human beings, there are times when we just don't, we just may not make the grade. So what do you do? Do you beat yourself up? Of what value is that? There are denominations out there, Christian denominations, by the way, that will actually take whips and they will beat themselves until they bleed. Foolishly trying to pay for their own sins and unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. Have you failed God at some time in some area ever? Confess it to him. And he will forgive you. And the matter is solved. Let it go. And don't keep bringing it up. Can you imagine somebody going to court? And the judge says, I see no reason to pursue this any further. I'm going to let you off. You're not going to pay anything. And you're not going to go to jail. I'm going to let you off. I'm going to send you home. Go home and enjoy your life and be good from now on. And the next day, you show back up in court. And you say to the judge, Judge, I just don't feel like I'm forgiven. And the judge says, I told you, I have let you go now go home and the next day you show up in the court knocking on the judge's desk and saying judge I just don't feel forgiven he is eventually going to have you locked up because you're nuts You've been forgiven. Now get over it. Get on and become effective for God. 
When God has forgiven you, you need to get up now. Thank him very much. Be very grateful. And get back on the horse. And get back on with your life. And begin to serve him with everything that is within you. Don't sit back down and say, I'm broken. I'm ruined. I've done this. I've done that. It's all about you, isn't it? You need to say, listen, I, I made some mistakes. But he died. His blood was shed for me. I accept his forgiveness. I accept what he's done. I'm grateful. And now to show that I'm grateful, I'm going to get out there and be a better believer than I've ever been before. I'm going to do more for the Lord. Because of what he has done for me. If we confess our sins. He is faithful to just. To forgive us our sins. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in heavenly realms. With every spiritual blessing. For he chose us in him. Before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. <coughs> to be adopted as his sons in Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves in him we have redemption through his blood forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You know, if you could surprise God, he's not God. You cannot surprise him. And since you can't surprise him, he knows what you're going to do from beginning to end. And he has lavished his grace on you with all wisdom and all understanding. He knows you and still he loves you. The Bible in Isaiah 55 says that seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him. And to our God. For, the, uh, 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 for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. Declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. What's he saying? You may not be able to forgive yourself. But he can forgive you. He is above you. He loves you. He has created you. And he will have compassion on you. If there's something that you feel that you failed the Lord in. If there's some area of your life that you feel you need to make it right with the Lord. Confess your sins to him. Come to him. Confess. Repent. Turn and go in the opposite direction. And he will forgive your sin. And then get up. Dust off the sackcloth and ashes. And get on with life. Get on with serving the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Lord, in Jesus' name. I just pray right now that if there be somebody in this audience or somebody online that's watching that may be saying, I, I have failed God. I have failed God. There are areas in my life where I have failed Him. Father, forgive them. Hold not their sin against them. Do not charge it to them. 
but let it be covered by the blood of Jesus. Give them strength to get up, strength to get on, and strength to go on serving you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.